Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, let's get started. I want to talk to you today about classical and Hellenistic Greek art. Basically, what I want to do is finish up chapter five, and then I have some uh, things I put together from my news feed. And because I search a lot of this kind of stuff, finding things to tell you guys, I get a lot of emails and messages and other things uh, about this kind of stuff. And so anyway, I want to share some of that with you. Um, so, 450 BCE, Niobid painter, and it's a calyx crater. Red figure means they're actually lighter than the background. And what I want to say about this is that we have this decorative register along the top and along the bottom, but it's truly decorative. And all of the ancient archaic and geometric pottery from Greece would usually have all of these figures organized in a straight line all the way around, probably two or three friezes, if you will. And so that's not happening here. And what I want to point out is that this is really about the high point, the acme, the pinnacle of Greek pottery. Um, it's a crater, which means that it has a large mouth up on top, and it has handles on the side. It's a calyx crater because the handles are low. Um, and it says it's from Orvito, Italy. That brings up another good point that I need to emphasize, and that is that what we have at this point is a lot of interact, interaction between Greece and the Italian peninsula. Now, we don't really have the Roman Empire for a few centuries yet, but there are people living and working and doing things on the Italian peninsula, and they're basically referred to as Etruscans. That's in Chapter six, I got a PowerPoint on that. We'll talk about that real soon. And so again, this is in, in really pretty poor shape, but you can see how the design is different. This is a calyx crater too, but it's a seam, not a line of of images put together in, as a register. Um, classical Greek sculpture. And what I wanted to say about this is such, um, it's pretty naturalistic. It's much more naturalistic than what we saw in the geometric and the archaic periods. And in fact, you can see a, a, a great deal of naturalism in, in the position of, of the hands, the way that she's kind of staring off body language. They call this a contra aposto. And that means that she's putting all of her weight really on the one leg, the other leg, you can see, it's almost as though she's about ready to, to step. Uh, a lot of detail 
in the drapery. Aphrodite. Actually, I'm not exactly sure that we know this is Aphrodite per se, but archaeologists and others almost always name statues of beautiful women from antiquity, Aphrodite or Venus. Venus is the Roman, Aphrodite is the Greek. We saw that early on. Venus of Bellendorf, just say it. And head of a woman from Chios. And again, 320, 300 BCE, a century and a half after the building of the Parthenon. Again, classical, in fact, people have written about this, is classical beauty, very smooth features, very delicate features, very graceful. And in a lot of ways, doesn't really portray a great deal of emotion. In fact, they almost seem to be kind of quiet, kind of sedate, as you see here in the Aphrodite, as you see here in the head of a woman. And so that is what they did at this time uh, in their sculpture. Hermes and the infant Dionysus. And uh, again, kind of stoic, not overly emotional. We see some of that contrapposto. He's got all his weight here, not so much on the other. Uh, we see the hairstyles, almost as though they're stylized. We see a great deal of understanding of human anatomy, and that is they understand the, the abdomen muscles, the calves, everything, the pecs, they, they understand the skeletal muscular system. Again, pretty sedate, wouldn't you say? It's not particularly or highly emotional. And I have a question. Yes, yes, yes. Um, do you think do you think that's how they study anatomy back in like back in the day and stuff? Just like looking at naked pictures of bodies and that's how they study of the human body? Well, here's kind of the thing. They were very adept at medicine. They under, and in fact, uh, Hippocrates, a great Greek physician, noted and mem remembered through the centuries uh, that when doctors become doctors, they take what is called the Hippocratic Oath. Now, I'm not sure how this all fits in together, other than the fact that they were if you will, they were woke. They understood what was going on. I'm not sure if the artists themselves actually did things like cut apart bodies and things. Don't really know that. Um, one artist did, I forgot who. I don't know if it was Leonardo da Vinci or someone else. It was like you one You are that... right on, yes, Armani. That's oh, where it's going exactly with this. There have been artists, and notably Leonardo, oh, okay. who was himself a scientist and an artist, and he secretly paid grave robbers to go get cadavers, that is, dead bodies, yeah. so he could cut them up. And he did drawings of them. And a lot of those kinds of drawings that he did of the human body they still use today, they were accurate, they were good. Uh, and so, yeah, 
I'm not sure if they went to that extent in ancient Greece, but it has been done. You're right on with that. Was it after this? After uh, Way after this. This is 350, 320 BCE, before uh, the birth of Jesus. Okay. And Da Vinci, roughly 1500. That's kind of a good mark. He worked before that and he worked after that too, but 1500, 520 years ago. Where okay. this is 2300 years ago. Okay, cool. Yeah, good question. And this is a model of the tomb of Mausolos. The mausoleum, again, we still use that term as well a mausoleum. It's a place where, where someone's buried, and it's a building, and it houses the dead. And so we still use that word as a mausoleum. A lot of times, even right here in St. Louis, you can go to the cemetery and you'll see all of the people buried on the countryside, all of the grave markers. And then sometimes in the middle of all this may be a big building and people are buried inside the walls. Actually, they're kind of like in drawers. You pull them out, put them in. I have a uh, question. Pardon? I have a question, I'm sorry. Yeah, What's the purpose of a mausoleum? Because like the first mausoleum I ever saw was Abraham Lincoln, and they moved him like under the mausoleum and stuff. Like, what's the purpose of the mausoleum? Well, it's the purpose is to commemorate the life. In the case of Abraham Lincoln, to build something of a memorial shrine to him. Not the Lincoln Memorial, which is in Washington, D.C., but you're talking about Springfield, right? Yeah. Right down the road, comparatively. And they just don't want Abraham Lincoln to be one of another grave marker in this big field. They want, they want to commemorate him to make a big building and inside of that they'll have his tomb and and you're right i think you were mentioning something about how they try to steal his body yeah yeah i heard many stories about that yeah and so yeah that's where he was and they tried they almost got away with it right yeah but it's basically to show that this person was special and, you know, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask. So it's like uh, what the Egyptians did with the pyramids with their pharaohs? Yes, very yes. much so. Yeah, um, that is absolutely correct. And, uh, of course, there are just you know, the pharaohs. There are a few pyramids, but then they made this gigantic place called the Valley of the Kings. And it's, in, in essence, it's like a big mausoleum that's cut into the side of the hill, you know. But absolutely, we've been doing this, our humankind has been doing this for, for a long time, the Egyptians, the Greeks. When we look at the Etruscans, they did something too, that was kind of unique in how they treated the dead. But yeah, uh, the belief in a, the Etruscans, belief in an afterlife, the Egyptians, that's why they buried all of their stuff with their pharaohs, so that they would have a chariot or tools or food or whatever it was in the afterlife. And so, yeah, these are all 
You guys are right on this. Variations on a theme. And we still do some of these things, still yet today. And so, uh, 330 BCE, very tall statue, six feet, nine inches high, Roman copy of a bronze statue. Uh, the original bronze is what's from 330 BCE. Uh, and the guy who carved this was Lysippos. And the title of it is Scraper. So, do I have any questions on that? That's an unusual title for. Do you think it represents like a goddess or a person with a interesting position, maybe? I don't know. Well, you're thinking, and that's what I like. Um, well, let me kind of backtrack a little bit. The Greeks were into athletics and athletic competition. Uh, a lot of things that we still have with us today came from ancient Greece. For instance, the Olympic Games, where all of the great athletes from all over the globe compete and see who is the fastest runner, who can throw the shot put and the discus the farthest. Hi, you know, you know all the sports. I have a question. Yes. Oh, uh, when does the Olympics started? Um, gee, that's a good question. Was it during this time? In Greece. I was thinking it was like, 125 BCE, maybe. I'll have to look that up. So this is like before, no, not before. But it, so it, this is like after this um, time. Yeah, the modern Olympic Games started in 1896. Okay. They modeled them on what the ancient Greeks did 2,000 years before. That's cool. And so anyway, yeah, the, the Greeks inspired a lot of stuff. Uh, the Olympic Games, a marathon is modeled after a Greek event, a race, was modeled on the fact that um, they were in battle and in battle you have before the invention of radio and cell phones and stuff. When one part of the army needed to talk to the other part of the army, they sent runners. They'd give the runner the orders, whatever the message would be, and they would go. And this happened to be, at this time, uh, 26.6 miles or 26, four, whatever. And so that's why we have a marathon today. We kind of use the same distance and it's all about the same thing, except no war. And so this is a statue of an athlete. And in ancient Greece, when they did athletic competition, Primarily it was men, and primarily they were nude. And they so admired the male body that these athletes oiled themselves down, just like bodybuilders do today, men and women. You see, you go on ESPN two or three or five, whatever, late night, and you'll see bodybuilding competition, and all of these competitors have this shine, and they shine light on them. And because they're oily, you can see all of the muscles 
much more clearly because it changes how the light reflects from your skin or their skin. And so they would oil up, they would compete, and after the competition, they would scrape the oil off their skin. And that's what's happening here. He's scraping the oil off his arm. A question. Yeah. Was it the same oil that we that bodybuilders use today, or it was like less oily oh. to a point where it starts to come off the skin? Well, it's oh, that's a really deep question. It's likely something like olive oil or something. Okay. Organic press olives, olive seeds, they give you oil. Um and Here's the issue. After the competition, they had to scrape it off their bodies because that was the best way to get it off. Yeah. Because back then they didn't have degreasing soap, like Dawn dishwashing liquid. Right. And so when they would use water, it would just, they wouldn't take it off. So that is the subject matter. And, and you can see, kind of composed, kind of sedate, kind of rational, not emotional, but rational. Yeah. And so this is classic Greek sculpture. And so what we start to see in this, and this is a little later, 320, 330 BCE starting to see a move. This is Hercules, a weary Hercules. And you can see, you can see he is muscular to be sure, even to the point where the veins popping through his skin. And he's got a long beard, which means he's kind of old. And typically when you had a beard on these statues, you see, he doesn't have a beard. He's a young man. An old man would have a beard, and it meant age, and it often meant wisdom. And we still even talk about wisdom with men's facial hair, too. Of course, that's kind of going away, as it should. But basically, back 50 years ago, you would talk about your professors, either they'd be a young professor or a gray beard. And a gray beard was a professor that had been tenured and had been teaching a long time. Maybe uh, the gray beards would be the deans and so on. Anyway, we don't say that anymore for good reason. And that is that women are a big part of higher ed now. It's not just a male thing, and that's good. But at any rate, here's a weary Hercules, and he's, he's kind of sedate, but we're starting to get a little glimpse of what will happen in the ensuing century, uh, third century BCE, one inch high, head of Alexander the Great. And, and this is uh, starting to show a little bit more thoughtfulness. It's not quite as stoic as say this guy. I have a question, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, was Shaven still exist back then? Shaving? Yeah, like shaving a beer. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it was. Uh -huh. But, you know, when you get old, you know, like me. So, 
Yeah, here's Alexander the Great, and he died young. He was a, a young man, but he wasn't that young. He probably did have some facial hair, and I think this is probably a good answer to your question. When you're young, you shave it off. When you get old, you wear it. And one of the things about this particular head reminds me of a point I'd like to make to you guys, and that is in ancient times, even through, even up till more recent times, you'll see that invaders and vandals and all other kinds of uh, bad actors come in and they destroy statues. And one of the things that they do a lot is try to mar the face. And that may be what happened to this, that it was Alexander because somebody took a hammer or something and broke his nose. There's another part of the sculpture that usually gets broken or attacked too. And that would be the genitalia. There are all of these statues from antiquity where invaders, subsequent civilizations came through and broke off the penises. And partly because of mores and so on. But the face, the face usually gets, if, if your enemies get your statue, the first thing they'll usually do is wreck the face. And if I could remind you of the Great Sphinx, in Egypt, that's almost entirely intact except the face. And so anyway, keep that in mind when you see a lot of these, these artifacts from the ancient world. And detail of a lion hunt and still roughly the same period. And it is a pebble mosaic and uh, this is kind of among the first of the mosaics we've seen in this class or at least covered in the book and we'll see mosaics being created all the way up through the 15th century in Europe the Romans were big on mosaics. Why? No takers? Let me offer this explanation. One of the concerns of artists in antiquity and even today and all of the time in between is how permanent will the artwork be? That's how they invented fresco, was that they painted on this wet plaster and the surface could be, could be disturbed, but the plaster and the pigment were so deep that it was kind of hard to erase. This being a mosaic, this is much more permanent than a painting, a fresco. And as been said before, you could put this mosaic on the floor and people could walk on it and it would still, it still would have its structural integrity. You could, you know, it would last. It would hold up to that kind of uh, use. And so anyway, Early example of mosaic. Um, and here is, I was just talking about fresco, and this is roughly from the same time. And this is a painting in a tomb. 
And if you think about it, all of the paintings that we've seen to date have been, have been protected in one manner or another. We looked at ancient cave paintings and the ones that survived had a very stable environment. They didn't get too cold. They didn't get too warm. They didn't get too wet. They didn't get too dry. It was a very stable environment and those paintings lasted tens of thousands of years. This is something that's roughly about 2,500 years old. And it's a fresco and the fact that we can still see it is, is a good example of how fresco is durable, but it's not all that durable. And you can see Persephone with her leg here, her leg there, her body, her torso, she's reaching out. There's her head. Hades up here, his head. You can kind of see his shoulder, his hands. Much of the detail is lost. And this is in a tomb. A tomb that, at least in theory, was undisturbed. So it had every reason to still be intact, but again, not as durable as a mosaic. And this is a Roman copy. Um, it's a Tessera mosaic. It's a it's a copy and you can see much more of it, at least as much as the detail, you see big chunks of it have fallen off the wall, but it's a mosaic of a panel painting. And the Greeks, we're very much into theater. And theater that we have today is really based on the Greek model of theater. And there's two different kinds of theater, the comedy and the drama. And if you ever see the Janus, the idea of two faces or two masks, side by side or back to back. One side is smiling, the other side frowning. That's out of Greek tradition, comedy, drama. And so anyway, what they figured out quite notably is that if they built a semicircular uh, stadium that the activity going on down here could be heard all the way through these seats. You see over here some people sitting up in the cheap seats, some people in the aisle, some down there. Give you a sense of the scale, but this is a Greek theater. And then they had a refinement called an amphitheater where they had put a semi circular half dome down here, which actually helped even, even assist in directing the sound up to the seats. And so it's kind of inventive, I think. No electricity no amps, no anything, just physics and sound. And so the Greeks were pretty fascinating people. Uh, we got some ruins here of various places in uh, Southeast Europe. I wanna point this one out too, Corinthian capital. 
when we looked at the Parthenon, we saw Doric and Ionic capitals. The Doric was pretty simple. The Ionic looked like a scroll. And oh, a century later, they developed this, a floral motif with these biomorphic designs on the capital. And this becomes so popular that much of what you'll see in Roman architecture will be the adoption of a Corinthian capital. Another monument, another temple, and a restored view. And you see this is in Turkey. Again, I want to remind you the Turks and the Greeks have been fighting for centuries. But they also had what you would call cultural cross-pollination. And so when the Turks invaded Greece, they brought with them their way of life, their architecture, their religion, their mathematics. You remember seeing the drawings of the Parthenon just prior to its demise, you'll see that the Turks had turned it into a mosque and on top of the Parthenon was a minaret, which is a tower that um, signifies this place being a mosque. And so, anyway, I want to point out here, you got the amphitheater going on back here, too. So, you know. And what this stuff would look like, this is 150 BCE refinements, but basically the same. 175 BCE. And so I want to talk to you finally about Hellenistic sculpture. And no longer are these statues composed, stoic, controlled. They become much more dramatic. And it represents a couple of things. One is that they had the skill to tell a story, say, much more than this. This is very stiff. This is very composed. It's very orderly, very rational. Uh, when we get here to the Hellenistic period, and you see this is 230, 220 BCE. Uh, killing himself and his wife. And she's already been stabbed. He's holding her up. And he's about, he's stabbing himself. I always, uh, I've been familiar with this statue for some time. Thought it was pretty gruesome. And you can see the blood dripping down. And it's gruesome in a whole other kind of way, too, because he's killing himself with his own sword. But there's an easy way to do this. You find this in a lot of traditions of falling on one's sword. That's what they call it. That's where the saying comes from. And I have that a question. Is you, pardon? Was suicide back then was like common? Okay, uh, you're cutting out a little bit. Could you repeat that? Was suicide common back in um, Greece? Oh, suicide. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. We certainly got some records of that. Um, I think there had been 
Egyptians commit suicide. I don't know how the timeline fits out, but Cleopatra in just uh, the first century BCE killed herself by letting herself get bit by a poisonous snake. Uh, yeah, did I she, don't know. Did she commit a suicide because she did something wrong and someone was coming after her? So she was like, you know what, I'm going to kill myself. Was it like that or like, I forgot the reason why she killed herself. Well, I think with Anthony and Cleopatra was kind of, that was pretty uh, complicated. As was a lot of these things is suicide and especially with uh, this guy here is a Gallic chieftain. And there is this idea that if you have been dishonored somehow that the proper course of action is to commit suicide. You say. Um, and so I don't know really who in invented that, but this guy, I was going to say this, this guy's going to drive this sword all the way down into his heart from going right here at the clavicle. That's awful. That, <laughs> that's hard to think about. And apparently either he lost a battle or he was dishonored in some fashion. And so we got the dying Gaul. And this, much more expressive than some of the other fallen warriors that we've seen from the classical period. And again, putting a weight on the arm the expression on the face, again, nude men. And it is a Roman copy of a bronze statue. I want to point that out too, because a lot of what we know about ancient Greek sculpture is that the Romans, when they take control, power, in the early days, the last days of the BCE and the early CE, common era, they, they collaborated with Greece and they made a lot of copies of their statues. And a lot of times, this is all we have left. And we're happy they cut these or they copied these statues. But oftentimes we don't have the original Greek bronze statue. And there's probably a simple explanation for that. And that is bronze is recyclable. If you don't like these, you can melt them down and make swords. You can <laughs> melt them down and do all kinds of things. On the other hand, a marble statue, the best you can do to recycle this is make gravel, if you follow me. And Nike of Samothrace, you guys wear Nike shoes. It's a Greek goddess. Uh, and finally, I want to sh point this, uh, see, all of this, much more expressive, much more detailed, seated boxer, and this is actually a bronze. Um, I want to show you this. And that is the Lackawan and his sons from Rome, Italy, first century CE marble. And there's a story to this that I, I want to relate to you. Lackawan was a priest, a high priest, and he warned the Trojans not to accept gifts from Greeks. 
He gave them this message. If they try to give you a gift, do not take it. I'm warning you, they're treacherous. They didn't listen to him. Greeks rolled in with their Trojan horse and the Greeks conquered the city-state of Troy. But the Greek gods were very upset with Lacawan, and they sent this serpent to kill him and his kids and look and his sons. And look at how, how incredibly active this is. And we're talking about stoicism and rational. This guy, look at his face. He is, this is, this is, hey, I'm desperate. This is expression of body language. This snake, that kind of giant snake, comes, wraps around, ends up right here, but it gets his leg and his leg, and all the way around, gets this guy, comes back around, biting Lackawan. And this sculpture, if I could um, be so, um, bold. Uh, this was uh, a sculpture that inspired a lot of Renaissance sculptors, most notably Michelangelo. He's, you know, it was like, wow, how this is like so, so beyond anything we can do today, and it inspired them to excellence. I want to add this too. The old market woman. This is Hellenistic too, and it's not ideal. It's actually kind of emotional. It's kind of broken up and you see some of the breast, the breast have been not chipped away. But bottom line is there's enough of this here. This was said, this kind of sculpture was said to have influenced the great Renaissance sculptor Donatello. And the idea that sculpture doesn't always have to be about a king or a god or a queen or a princess. Ordinary people suffering through this, is, this poor lady. Got a little basket of stuff here from the market, but this is quite a quite a change from something like this, the seated boxer, or Aphrodite, for example. You see. And so Hellenistic becomes much more expressive, much more theatrical, much more uh, much more adept at describing detail as well, and weight and facial expressions. And so that's that. And, and I want to show you something here. And that is all right, where did I go? There we are. Can you see that? The Etruscans? Yep. Okay, good. I'll bring it back to full size. And we'll take a look at it. So the Etruscans, the Etruscans, we'll talk about them more later. But they are kind of the precursors to the Romans. They lived on the Italian peninsula. And they were to the Romans what 
the Aegean cultures were to the Greeks. But I got something else for you right now. And that is I copied some stuff from my email, news feed, stuff that comes in. And I wanted to show you that the stuff that we're looking at is largely not just stuff that happened a long time ago, but it's still alive. It's still being looked at. It's still being uh, studied. It's still being restored and so on. Uh, and so what I have here is let me get you on the screen share guys this can you see that the greek reporter yeah good greece unveils spectacular new lighting for the acropolis we were just talking about the acropolis last week i showed you a film uh we talked about it a lot and this is what they're doing right now as we speak. This was written September 30th, six days ago. And this is what they're doing. They're lighting this up. The Acropolis is the hill. On top of the Acropolis up here is the Parthenon. But there are, as you learned, many other, many other temples and buildings on this hill. And so the new lighting was unveiled Wednesday in the presence of the Hellenic Republic, Katerina Skeller Opoalo, you know, anyway, a bunch of dignitaries were on hand and it was live streamed on YouTube. And I, the video is on here Part of the problem is that uh, a lot of it's in Greek. And so, and this is like 48 minutes, so we don't have enough time. But if you want to scroll through this and take a look at what they're doing, it is spectacular. And they are first a series of projects that aim at an overall upgrade of the Acropolis infrastructure and services that are both funded and implemented by the Onassis Foundation. Is Onassis a name that you're familiar with? Jackie Onassis. Yes, yes, who said that? Uh, Robin. Robin, you, you got it going. Yeah, Jackie Onassis the widow of John Kennedy, and she married this guy, and he was like one of the richest guys in Europe. His name was Aristotle Onassis, good Greek name, and he made a lot of money because he owned shipping. He owned fleets of, of cargo vessels and things. And so anyway, this is kind of like if you were over here, this would be like, he was like, um, probably Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or somebody like that of um, uh, Elon Musk of Greece. So anyway, you know, and these rich people sometimes donate money and do good things with all the cash. And so here we are. Uh, and it gives you beautiful picture and that was one thing that just kind of came across I said hey we were looking at this why don't we oh, I gotta move this on the bottom sorry guys um, and let me get back on the PowerPoint, Parthenon lighting. 
This is in Fox News. And, you know, we talked about sources, good sources. You say, Bohack, this is Fox News. It can't be. I'll show you why it's a, a credible source. Okay, hold on. Well, this opened before I'll go to this one. Mona Lisa. So are you guys seeing this? Yeah. Yeah, I'm still, it won't open this link. Okay, we'll try this one. 